Hello everyone, Coinhound here. Today we are going to take a look at an incredible silver round. The 2021 Sitting Bull and Buffalo round from the Oglala Lakota Sioux Nation. A round that is rendered in ultra high relief. This round is absolutely stunning. So let's take a look at the round. Let's take a look at the story uh, of the Native Americans in the West in the latter part of the 1800s. And of course, let's take a bit of a look at the life of Sitting Bull himself. All right, before we get started here, uh, just a quick reminder, if you do end up liking this video and content, please hit that like button. It does help the video and the channel. Please subscribe and hit that notification bell so you won't miss any of my content. All right, let's take a look at this round. So this is a one ounce, three nines find, uh, sitting bull silver round. It is ultra high relief. So we're gonna take a close look at it here. And I'm not in my normal studio and I don't have a phone tripod with me. So we will do the best that we can here. All right, trying to hold this steady. All right, so you can see the ultra high relief here and I am gonna pick it up. Or maybe if I just bring the phone down, this will work. Nope. Let's do a little bit of a zoom in action. Okay, so here is a close up view of the round. And you can see that beautiful high relief there, that beautiful finish, uh, the detail on Sitting Bull's face and his headdress. Up near the top of the round, Oglala Lakota Sioux Nation. On the bottom right hand side, we have one Troy ounce, one dollar at the bottom, so this is legal tender. For that tribal group of one dollar and then turning it this way oh no nope, looks like i gotta turn it this way sorry folks three nines fine 2021 okay now i'm going to pull this up a little bit so you can see the detail look at that just amazing I'm going to turn it a little sideways so you can get a bit of an idea of the high relief. And if you turn it all the way sideways, you can see that this is an unusually thick capsule. And to get the high relief, it looks like the round itself is rather thin, but then the high relief gives it uh, quite a thickness to it. So this here... Uh, is just uh, spectacular. Now, it is expensive. This is a limited edition, 2021 Ultra High Relief. Uh, there's 2,500 minted. So a very limited mintage, uh, and it is a bit pricey as a result, $99. Now, I have no idea if there's going to be much demand for these, if they're going to hold that value, uh, may well have overpaid, but I just loved the round so much, I decided I had to have it, okay? Now on the back side, we have a buffalo. So this is kind of like a buffalo round, uh, and I'm not sure which is technically or officially the obverse or the reverse, um, but this is the other side, and you can see the buffalo there. On the bottom, it says Indian. Sovereign Nation. And then up at the top, American Buffalo. And then you have the incredible detail of the Buffalo. Look at that. Let's see if we can zoom in a bit more on the Buffalo. Now that's going to cause it to be more shaky. I apologize for that. So you see the detail on the Buffalo there. Absolutely incredible. So I did do a video earlier where I looked at some modern takes on the generic buffalo round. Uh, and this is another one. 
So I will link that other video uh, in the description. Uh, but I think this is my favorite one so far. But it is pricey. Uh, not something you'd be wanting to stack. And I just dropped it there. So sorry about that. Not the most professional operation today. So there you are. You have the buffalo. And you have Sitting Bull. I mean, just, just look at that. What a piece. What a piece. Okay. Uh, and I did get it from the government mint or gov mint, I think, as they call themselves. Um, I don't usually buy stuff from them. Some of it seems a bit pricey. Uh, but I did, this item did catch my eye. And I did pull the trigger on it. Okay, now that we've taken a look at the round, uh, let's uh, take a brief look uh, at Sitting Bull and his role uh, in the Indian Wars in the second part of the 19th century. So uh, there's a photo of him on the screen there, um, arguably one of the best known, if not the best known, uh, Native Americans uh, in the United States uh, in the 19th century. Before we get into uh, his story, let's uh, go back briefly and uh, provide a little bit of context. And I guess a good starting point uh, would be a Supreme Court decision, a uh, decision of uh, Cherokee versus Georgia of 1831. Uh, this was a court case uh, in which uh, the Cherokee sued the state of Georgia over a land dispute. In the uh, map there, uh, you have highlighted the Cherokee Nation. And the Cherokee Nation at this point, by 1831, uh, to a large extent, had assimilated into the Western way of life. Uh, they had their capital at New Echota, uh, which was in Georgia. Uh, they had a, a constitutional form of government. Uh, they had newspapers, um, many of them dressed in Western attire. But nevertheless, uh, they found themselves uh, at loggerheads with the state of Georgia over their land. And uh, this Supreme Court decision was significant because uh, it ruled that Native American tribes were not subject to the jurisdiction of state governments. They were subject to the Constitution of the United States, but not to state governments. Uh, they were, in essence, defined as dependent nations. So nations within the United States that were um, dependent and under the umbrella of the American Constitution. So the result of this was that uh, in ensuing years, uh, when the United States government was interacting with tribes, um, they interacted with them almost as nation to nation. So the interaction, the mechanism of interaction, was treaties in many cases. Now, we're going to fast forward to 1851 to kind of get into the story of Sitting Bull here. And uh, the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851 uh, is a significant starting point. So you can see here in Wyoming uh, and Nebraska and South Dakota, North Dakota and Montana, uh, you can see um, this highlighted area here, okay, and then Fort Laramie is down here in Wyoming. So the Fort Laramie Treaty was a, a, a treaty agreement uh, with the Native American tribes in this region uh, in which the Native Americans uh, agreed uh, to basically uh, move to and reside within the boundaries of this highlighted area and they agreed uh, to cease fighting against the United States government, uh, to cease fighting amongst themselves, and to allow free passage of Americans uh, through their lands. In return for that, uh, the United States government uh, would defend the tribes uh, from wrongdoing uh, at the hands of Americans, and I believe there may have been some financial incentives uh, as well was imperfect in a lot of ways because uh, of the uh, way the two different cultures kind of operated. Um, so Americans were used to represent representative government. Uh, Native Americans, from what I understand, at least in this region, had more of a consensus type of governing action. And even though some of the more significant chiefs had agreed to this treaty, uh, not everyone throughout the various tribes and communities uh, agreed with the treaty. 
Okay, As more and more Americans began moving west uh, and passing through those lands, this opened up much more opportunity for conflict between the two sides. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, the treaty ended up being broken both by the Native Americans and by the American citizens passing through, and in some cases, the American government. Uh, The conflict that's going to result, which ultimately is going to manifest itself in a conflict between um, the Native American tribes of the region and the United States government, specifically the United States Army, uh, have come to be known as the Sioux Wars. And they lasted uh, basically from the 1850s, around this time we're talking about, up to um, 1890. Uh, with uh, the massacre at Wounded Knee. So as conflict and tensions began to increase, uh, the United States government is going to reopen the original treaty. Uh, They're going to work out a new treaty. Um, But in this treaty, uh, there is going to be reduced land um, for the uh, Sioux tribes in particular. And uh, you can see that reduced land here kind of in the gray area. Now, um, once again... Uh, Not all the Native American tribes agreed with this, Uh, and many of them uh, refused uh, to move uh, into this reduced reservation area, all right? And one of the key leaders of that resistance was Sitting Bull. So um, so you're going to have ongoing conflict, uh, and it's going to kind of culminate or it's going to reach its climax, perhaps would be the better term, uh, in 1876. Uh, at the Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, often known as Custer's Last Stand. Uh, Sitting Bull and um, had basically been leading his people nomadically uh, away uh, from the American troops, and they were being tracked, and uh, this uh, Little Bighorn is a river in Montana, and Custer was part of a larger military detachment that was kind of in pursuit, and he was sent out as kind of an advanced detachment uh, scouting, looking to make contact uh, with Sitting Bull and, and his people. Uh, so when Custer came upon the encampment, uh, if you will, uh, he did so um, under an understanding um, that there would be reinforcements coming. Uh, and this is where it becomes a bit controversial, the decision Custer made. Um, and it's not clear what information he was acting upon. Um, some historians believe that he had been expected to kind of investigate and scout and then wait for the broader deta- the bro- broader reinforcements to come before taking any major actions. Uh, but that's not what happened. Um, Custer decided uh, to attack the encampment, and we don't ha- we're not privy to the intelligence or the information he was using about what he thought the opposition was going to be why he might have attacked, you know, did he think that they uh, had become aware of his presence and they were going to try and flee or whatever the case might be. Uh, But he does make the fateful uh, decision to attack and uh, ends up attacking a much larger force. And as I was looking through this, I was surprised to learn uh, a better armed force of Native Americans. Uh, Many of Custer's uh, um, soldiers apparently had uh, single-shot carbines, Um, whereas many of the Native Americans actually had repeating Winchesters. Uh, So they were outnumbered, and they were outgunned. They were badly defeated, okay? Uh, Every Custer and every one of his men uh, were killed in the battle, or died in the battle might be a better term, because there are some Native American accounts uh, that some of Custer's soldiers uh, ended up actually killing themselves as the Native Americans uh, came in, Um, perhaps fearful of what the Native Americans might do to them or whatever, I don't know, okay? Uh, But anyways, uh, so his whole detachment is wiped out. This is a huge victory um, for uh, Sitting Bull. Uh, I believe if I have my information correctly, I think Crazy Horse, another very prominent Native American, participated in the battle as well. And uh, it was kind of the the peak moment for the Native Americans uh, during these series of wars. As news made its way back to the U.S., Uh, This was only going to inflame opinion uh, against the Native Americans uh, and result in a harsher crackdown. Uh, Sitting Bull and his people are going to continue to be on the run. He actually ends up fleeing up into Canada. You know, some of the other leaders of other tribes surrendered to the U.S. government. He fled with his people up into Canada. 
uh, but they had a very difficult go of it up there, and they um, were starving, and uh, things just weren't working out. Uh, so he ultimately did return uh, and surrender himself and his people to the U.S. government, uh, and he was assigned um, uh, to a reservation, okay? I think it was the Standing Rock Reservation, but um, don't quote me on that. Uh, and so uh, that was about 1883. Now, uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, at that point, uh, Sitting Bull, very well known, uh, ends up becoming uh, a member of the famous uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Uh, Buffalo Bill Cody had created a, a, a traveling show uh, in which uh, he conducted various reenactments of the West, in which he um, brought to bear various uh, aspects of the lifestyle in the West to audiences in the East. Uh, so they had shooting ex exhibitions and roping expeditions and horse riding, but they also reenacted various events of the West. And uh, so, that, uh, so that's a pretty fascinating thing uh, about two cultures coming together. And um, so uh, Sitting Bull, uh, for a period of time, was a participant. Uh, he was well paid by the standards of the time for his participation. There were other Native Americans as well that did participate and travel with uh, the, con the contingent uh, as it went from city to city. Now, um, to kind of bring the story to a close, uh, as we move into the late 1800s, uh, the Native Americans are um, in a state of, I don't want to say defeat, uh, but a, a state of almost hopeless desperation, okay? And there is the emergent, uh, emergence of a religious or a spiritual movement that came to be known as the Ghost Dance Movement. Uh, many uh, tribal leaders, or at least spiritual leaders, uh, began to uh, surmise or to put forth the idea that uh, by abandoning their spiritual practices, their spiritual principles, um, they had brought these various calamities upon themselves, and that if they had a kind of a spiritual renewal or a revival, if you want to use kind of more of an American term, um, that that could uh, bring about a change in their circumstances. Now, the United States government felt very threatened by this ghost dance movement. They were worried it was going to lead to uh, an uptick in resistance uh, when it appeared that things were kind of at the end of the conflict. And uh, so they did crack down very hard. Uh, Sitting Bull had a lot of influence. Uh, they were worried that he um, might be playing a role in this. Uh, so uh, they did, government representatives ordered that he be arrested. Uh, this arrest was to be carried out by Indian police on the reservation he was on. And uh, he resisted, and he and his follower, you know, there was a, a gunshot of some sort that went off, and there ended up being kind of a, a gunfight, and a Sitting Bull and a number of his followers were killed. Uh, so that brings the end, uh, to the end, brings to the end, brings to an end, uh, the story of Sitting Bull, okay? Um, and uh, the ghost dance movement and basically Native American resistance is going to come to an end not long after that uh, at Wounded Knee, uh, where a U.S. Army contingent was meeting with some leaders uh, at that tribal location. And, you know, similar to the case we just talked about, there was a gunshot. The U.S. Army responded with fire, opened fire, and basically conducted a, a widespread killing of those that were present. And so men were killed, women were killed, children were killed. There's dispute over the number. Some say 150 to 200 Native Americans killed. Some say up to 500. Um, but in, in many ways, it was a massacre. So this was kind of the concluding event, which uh, basically brought the Native American resistance to an end. Um, and, uh, we are not then going to transition into both sides trying to figure out how to make the uh, reservation life work. You know, how do you go forward under those circumstances? What's the role of the Native American going to be in American society and all of that? Um, uh, so that's, uh, pretty much the end of the story. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you do, did enjoy it, please hit that like button. It helps the video, helps the channel. 
Subscribe if you're not subscribed and hit that notification bell and you'll be notified of my content right when it comes out and that way you won't miss it. All right, everyone. Have yourself a great day, a great evening. Uh, this is Coin Hound signing out.